This program is made possible in part by the generous support from the Smithsonian Institution and the Arthur A. Rutledge Endowment in Labor Studies. Kokamerikeng Kaero ka Nihon Koko ga Shian Hole Hole Bushi are the songs of Japanese immigrants who worked on Hawaii's sugar plantations in the late 19th and early 20th centuries. They sang as they worked, and their lyrics provide a record of joys and sorrows. Hole Hole is a native Hawaiian word for dried cane leaves, and Bushi, a Japanese term for melody or tune. The first, or Issei generation immigrants, brought their music from Japan but changed the lyrics to reflect life in Hawaii. Aloha, I'm Jake Shimobukuro. The ukulele has only four strings. And because of this, it has a kind of power. Traditional hole hole bushi, based on work songs from Japan, have just four lines of verse. But they tell powerful stories like the opening song about the dilemma facing contract workers when their contract is over. I believe that music communicates the purest form of human emotion. First of all, it's emotionally beautiful. I mean, regardless of what you might think in terms of legacy, in terms of remembrance, in terms of history, the songs themselves have a character and tone all their own, unforgettable. It's basic like Buddha head blues, you know what I mean? Um, it's like listening to Muddy Waters if, if uh, you're from Mississippi. It's the same thing, I don't care. If you don't like the blues, there's a voice there that you can't ignore. It grips you. Uh, it's gripping culture. Buddha head blues may be more politically correct to say our story is about the Japanese American blues. In the introduction, you saw ukulele master Otasan performing with music teacher Harry Urata. In Japanese, a teacher is called sensei. Sensei Urata became a force in the preservation of Hawaii's plantation history. He was born in Hawaii, but studied in Japan as a child. He returned to Hawaii for his last years of high school. World War II meant harsh treatment for many Japanese Americans. Harry Urata was summoned from a classroom discussion on democracy, arrested, and confined at the Hono Uli Uli internment camp in Hawaii. You know, they had a visiting day every Sunday. I told my mother to bring, you know, a guitar. Not nothing to do, you know, lots of time, you know, in, in there. A fellow prisoner, newspaper man Kenpu Kawazoi, spent many hours with Urata, telling stories about the early Japanese immigrants to Hawaii and the folk music they created. After the war, Harry spent 20 years working as a music teacher, band leader, and radio host. But he kept thinking about the stories of the pioneering immigrants who came to Hawaii from Japan. So in the 1960s, while many Americans listened to folk songs by Joan Baez and Bob Dylan, Harry went to Hawaii plantation communities and tea houses to record the songs from the cane fields. More than 50 of his recordings have been preserved, like this one, reminding us that many early immigrants saw their work in Hawaii 
as important for the land of their birth. Although both men and women sang these songs, Hole Hole work was mostly women's work. Many of the songs provide a direct connection to history from a woman's perspective. One of Urata Sensei's former music students, now an anthropologist, appreciates what these songs reveal. Well, I think Hore Hore Bushi and the, and the reason why it's become such a touchstone for our knowledge of plantation experience is because these are songs that seem to come from the people. In other words, the melody may have been set, but people were willing to throw in their own lives and their own sentiments into the song, and that makes them so valuable. If we want to know something of what some of these women's lives were like, not everybody's, but some of these women's lives, what they were like, then in some ways we could do no better than to listen to their own words as expressed through song. Harry collected and preserved these songs as a history of Japanese immigrants in Hawaii, and equally important, he taught the songs and stories to new generations of students. When I was like four and learning, you know, my alphabets and all that stuff, so it seemed normal to not know it, not know what I was singing in <laughs> Japanese. Um, so my mother had to basically read the song over and over so I could memorize it. But he, Sensei would sit there and explain what the song meant and kind of go through the history. And that was the fun part because it was like storytelling, you know, every Saturday. I got involved with uh, Japanese culture through my grandparents. And one day we started singing Mary Had a Little Lamb in Japanese. And my grandma got so excited that she took us or took me uh, to Rata Sensei from the time I was four. And that's where we started. <laughs> Mama Kogeru, which is, I think those few lines just kind of explain so much in so little. It's raining, the clothes are getting wet, child is crying on his mother back, the rice is getting burnt. I mean, it's just, it tells a story in, in just four lines, you know, and it's, it's like, that was life. He explained they were the plantation workers' songs, the um, ladies who were working in the plantation fields, um, how they would they were going through hardships and they wanted to go back to Japan, but they didn't have enough money because they didn't get paid well. And so the thing of leaving a village where, yes, things were tough, but you had your home, you had your parents, you had your friends, you had your ancestors, you had the graves you could visit, you had a familiar woods to play in, and then you're brought into a setting in which there's nothing but cane field around you, and you're living in really ramshackle barracks, and you're working six and a half days a week. You have no life other than gambling or occasional prostitutes. Urata Sensei also served as a resource for academics, like Dr. Franklin Odo, about conditions faced by early immigrants. Mm. So Hawaii, Hawaii, I, I dream mm -hmm. and I came, but now the work itself is so hard, I shed my tears. In, in the cane field. Did they usually stay where they were? I heard these stories about people who ran away. Oh yes, they ran away. Especially the, the good place to run away is Waimanalo and uh, Kona. The people I interviewed, they used to make a uh, friend with the uh, Hawaiians. So mm. first uh, foreign language they learned was uh, Hawaiian language. Not English. Not English. The big boss, Haole people, that's kind of high, you know? Mm -hmm. uh, you know, it's it not so easy for immigrants to get in contact. Mm. In 1920, Katsue Asakura came to Wainaku's Nikai Sen camp on the island of Hawaii. Although housing had improved from the days when workers lived in huts with cane-thatched roofs, 
conditions were still primitive, and plantation routines were relatively unchanged from the early days of immigration. Excitement and disappointment marked the arrival at her new home. We stopped for a little while and it looked like we were going into this house. I thought, what a nice house we had come to. But we kept going and we arrived at what was to be our new home. It turned out that the previous house belonged to the plantation manager. I worked from 6 o'clock in the morning until 4 o'clock in the afternoon. That's the way it was. We were given an hour for meals. In between, they'd give us a little bit of time to smoke. In Japan, I wasn't used to doing this kind of extremely difficult work, and it was hard to bear until I got used to it. The women would go into the fields where the cane was planted and go along the lines. As people did the hole hole work, we sang the songs. それで、その <laughs> Just like the song says, I cried all the time in the cane field. But it was not only because of the very hard work and thinking about Japan, it was more. The first thing that occurred to me was that if I had stayed in Japan, I'd have children. I'd have this or that. Yeah, that's what hit me more than anything else. <laughs> あ、弁当箱かたに。ほれほれ the men and women went to the same place to work. The men had to work three very long lines, and the women had to complete two lines in the same amount of time. That was already decided and set. The kind of work we're talking about is not hole hole, but ho hana, the hoeing of weeds. So when we reached the end of the lines, we'd get together and talk story. The Luna would be off at a distance. When they arrived on horseback to check us out, someone would signal to us by going, <coughs> <coughs> At that point, we would all go back to our work. So that's why, rather than completing the lines, we'd always leave a little bit left. So when the Luna came by, we would be busy finishing the line. Barbara Kawakami was born in Japan, but came to Hawaii as a baby. She was raised on a sugar plantation. She dropped out of high school to work as a seamstress to help her widowed mother make ends meet. Eventually, Barbara went back to school and received a master's degree in Asian studies. Her interest in the clothing and stories of the early Japanese immigrants led her to write a book on plantation history. Her mother's story left an indelible impression and even when my mother took in laundry and at 4.30 in the morning, she's in the wash house scrubbing and pounding and boiling the laundry out of doors. And late at night, with her charcoal iron, and I would do my homework be beside my mother and many times fall asleep. And when I woke up in the middle of the night, I would hear my mother sobbing. And my mother never showed her weakness in front of her children. We didn't realize growing up, you know, how sad it was. Even when I went to college, 
I, I remember when I started writing papers in sociology, anthropology, and、uh, to write the life stories, you know, of the past. I thought, gosh, I have great things to write about. Barbara's research brought together four women who worked side by side in the cane fields almost a lifetime ago. I did everything from Hanawai. Water cane, hot cane, pula pula, cane seed, hapaiko, carrot cane. You worked ten hours a day. One month pay was fifteen dollars. You worked twenty-six days. Then you get that much pay. So, if you don't work the full twenty-six days, your pay was deducted. A so-called bonus was part of regular pay. It meant that many would work even when sick. Mrs. Kiku Yoshida remembers a song taught to workers by the luna, or foreman, about the bonus. Small pay, harsh conditions, and the bonus system led to a strike in 1920. Vivid memories remain of the hardships and evictions. And of marching together on the picket line. From Arakawa's, we marched down on Deeper Road. Then we went to Honolulu. We held banners and marched through the streets. And we heard the Haole women watching on the roadside with tears in their eyes. Some people were laughing because a banner showed how much we were getting paid. Work clothing varied from plantation to plantation. Yasu Sato and Haru Ueno posed with a friend to show off the Waipahu style in work attire. This is me. This is me. I'm on the other end. Protective clothing was necessary, and just getting dressed for work was a chore. I wore the shirt. The underpants came down to the knees. Then I wear the kyahang leggings. Otherwise, the centipedes crawl up while you're working. Then I wear the tabi. That has three buttons on each side. The leggings have five buttons. Then I have to put on my tesashi arm guard. So altogether, ten buttons. That's humbug. In 1868, the first immigrants arrived in Hawaii from Japan, but the major immigration period was 1885 to 1924, when more than 200,000 Japanese came to Hawaii. Most of the immigrants were men, but some brought wives or sent back for picture brides. Immigrant communities also saw gambling, alcohol, and prostitution. These became subject matter for folk songs. Chinaman, yeah. Pakistan to moi moi is Hawaiian words. Sleep, sleeping, yeah. You make akahi kara one dollar. Yeah. So better than if you work, you make only thirty five cents. Thirty five cents. But if you sleep with the、uh, Pakistan, you make a dollar. Ohara mate 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 o asan ga kuru ke ban bai. Ame ame, nui nui makana. You know that the Bombay ame ame nui nui makana. 
that's just hush hush. <laughs> Ohara <laughs> is one pretty lady, the widow, maybe in Hamakua coast. Ame ame, but Japanese they uh, uh, pronounce that uh, Hawaiian words ami ami is to rotate the hips, rotate the hips. like the hula. hula but ame yeah. ame in the original was uh, they thought it was rain. Nui nui is uh, in Hawaiian word much, very much. Makana is to give. So there'll be a lot of rain to get. So it didn't make no, sense. No, no, no. Doesn't make. If you say the ame ame is yeah. rain, no, no, doesn't make sense. So ami ami. ami so if ame. you if you if with this new information, what the the holy holy tune begins to make sense. It's kohara mate mate. Wait wait a while, uh, Mrs. Kohara. Mm -hmm. The the because the Chinese will be coming. Mm -hmm. um, Bombay, uh, ami ami. Or the the rotating of the hips or the action of the hips is sexual uh, connotation. Nui nui, um, nui, nui very, much, very much, and nui, makana, nui, very to much. give. I suppose one could overdo saying that this, this characterizes plantation life, that, that the simi side, um, the body side is what is um, representative of life. My hunch is that this is uh, not uncommon but it's not necessarily the rule. I think the Hole Holobushi are important to bring ethnic history, immigration history, American history back to center course, to set the record straight, to make sure that people don't excessively romanticize um, their origins. Annexation made Hawaii a United States Territory in 1898. In 1907, the so-called Gentlemen's Agreement limited immigration to immediate relatives of Japanese residents. Under this agreement, marriages were arranged in Japan with partners having no contact except perhaps the exchange of photographs and letters. While early plantation life could be rough, Many couples found love and lifelong commitment. Katsue Asukura shares a song about passionate love. As the community grew and many moved away from the plantation, the Hole Hole Bushi changed from songs sung at work to songs sung for leisure. Sisters Kara and Lacey Sutsuse demonstrate the tea house style. music continue, with new generations carrying out the tradition and new venues bringing new arrangements to audiences around the world. Kara and Lacey Tsutsuse, like me, are five generations removed from the Ise. They learned about Japanese culture from their grandparents and from Urata Sensei. They give back to the community by performing at senior centers. No, I do not think many of my friends know about their culture. I think my sister and I are actually really lucky that our grandparents share their stories with us. Sometimes we think these songs, this tradition, will die out. 
But then there is a revival, a song contest, CD, movie, book, or video. Check out this excerpt from the 2009 Tokyo Summer Festival, where a new arrangement of Hole Hole Bushi was presented to an appreciative audience. Hole Hole Bushi gives us a window into the history of Japanese Americans in Hawaii. Like other folk songs, they are a unique and important thread in the tapestry of America. Mahalo. We've had um, people saying, this is our history, we need to know it. If we don't know the truth, uh, we will never be able to um, build any kind of foundation for our collective or individual identities or, or psychological security. We can't be who we are if we don't know who we are. I mean, we can't even make that assertion, so we've got to dig and we've got to, no matter what the risks might be, we have to begin to do that. This program is made possible in part by the generous support from the Smithsonian Institution and the Arthur A. Rutledge Endowment in Labor Studies.